Welcome to this Pearl of Laboratory Medicine brought to you by AACC and the Clinical Chemistry Trainee Council. View this and many more pearls as well as other free educational material at traineecouncil.org. Hello, my name is Yach Nakataria. I'm a Clinical Chemistry Fellow at Boston Children's Hospital. Welcome to this Pearl of Laboratory Medicine on Utility of HIL in Clinical Chemistry. Hemolysis icterus and lipemia, also commonly known as HIL, are the most common specimen integrity issues that can interfere with laboratory tests and may lead to erroneous results and interpretations and ultimately to inappropriate medical decisions. HIL indices are an objective way to detect interferences compared to the traditional practice of visual inspection. Visual inspection is subjective, unreliable, and time-consuming. Whereas measurements of serum indices are available on most modern-day chemistry analyzers and provide a standardized and reproducible tool to estimate interferences. This subsequently improves quality, efficiency, and uniformity of the laboratory testing process. While there are definitive strengths of HIL serum indices, it is important to recognize the limitations of HIL detection on automated analyzers as well. On most chemistry autoanalyzers, hemolysis in icterus is detected by spectrophotometry. Hemoglobin absorbs light at wavelengths between the ranges of 340 to 440 nanometers and between 540 to 580 nanometers. Bilirubin absorbs light at wavelengths between 400 and 500 nanometers. Lipemia causes light scattering that subsequently affects the measurements of assays utilizing nephilometric and turbidometric methods. There is an overlap in the spectra of hemoglobin, bilirubin, and lipemia. While there is no currently defined best method for measuring serum indices, manufacturers' product inserts may provide useful information on how the interferences were assessed. More than one HIL interference may simultaneously be present in a patient's sample. The presence of one HIL interference may adversely affect the measurement of another HIL interference. Non-HIL interference may also be present. Examples of such interference include methem albumin, beta carotenes, dyes, and contrast media present in the blood. Lastly, HIL indices do not replace standard assays of hemoglobin, bilirubin, or triglycerides, since it is a nonspecific semi-quantitative method. Analyzer manufacturers perform interference testing to assess potential HIL interferences on analytes. Various degrees of hemolysis, icterus, and lipemia are tested to determine if the result of an assay is significantly altered. Based on acceptability criteria of interferences, the manufacturer defines a cutoff value. In the example shown here, the response of the ABC analyte is not affected by increasing bilirubin concentrations. However, the same does not for the analyte DEF. The DEF response changes with increasing bilirubin concentrations. Hemolysis index is assessed by the amount of red pigmentation associated with free hemoglobin. Upon damage to the cell membrane, hemoglobin and other intracellular components from erythrocytes are released into the extracellular space of blood. Here is a list of analytes that are commonly affected by hemolysis in the lab. This is by no means a comprehensive list and you should always refer to the product manual utilized in your lab. Release of analytes found in high concentration in red blood cells will be falsely elevated. Examples of such analytes include potassium, magnesium, phosphate, LDH, and AST. Hemoglobin binds to haptoglobin, therefore haptoglobin exhibits a negative interference on the measured haptoglobin concentration. Presence of hemolysis also causes a negative or positive interference on the troponin T and I assays. The degree and direction of the interference is method dependent. For example, Hemolysis falsely decreases concentrations of the CT and T assays on the Roche instruments, whereas CTNI measured on the Vitros 5600 is falsely increased in hemolyzed samples. Refer to your manufacturer guidelines to determine how your laboratory troponin assay is affected by hemolysis. 
The actual mechanism of hemolysis interference in troponin assays is not well understood. Experimental evidence suggests that release of proteases from red blood cells degrade the antigenic region of the CTNT assays, thus preventing them to be detected. Additionally, release of erythrocytes intracellular fluid may also cause dilution of analytes found at low concentrations in the erythrocyte. The way to correct hemolysis largely depends on the analyte and the instruments in your laboratory. One way to deal with hemolyte specimens is to first determine if the H index is above the hemolysis cutoff limit for the analyte of interest. If the H index is below the cutoff, you may proceed with testing. However, if the H index is above the cutoff limit, determine whether you're able to dilute the sample by referring to the manufacturer guidelines. If dilution is acceptable, you may proceed to testing after diluting the specimen. If dilution is not acceptable, determine whether it is in vitro or in vivo hemolysis. This can be accomplished by measuring haptoglobin. Decreased concentrations of haptoglobin are pronounced and a specific effect in in vivo hemolysis, whereas haptoglobin levels remain unchanged in the in vitro hemolysis setting. In instances of in vitro hemolysis, the specimen should be rejected and the clinical staff ought to be notified to recollect the sample properly. In instances of in vivo hemolysis, the clinical staff ought to be notified and the underlying pathology should be addressed first. As a lab professional, you can also recommend alternative testing. For example, you can recommend measurement of ALT as opposed to AST to help evaluate liver function. Ictric index is a measure of yellow pigmentation of the sample due to increased bilirubin concentration. Bilirubin exists in unconjugated and conjugated forms. They are both thought to equally contribute to the interference. Elevated bilirubin concentrations could be the result of hepatic diseases, hemolytic disorders, and other obstructive biliary disorders. Bilirubin has been shown to produce a negative bias on assays that use sequential oxidase and peroxidase enzymatic reactions. For example, bilirubin produces a negative bias on common assays for cholesterol, glucose, and triglycerides. Bilirubin also produces a negative bias for the Jaffe creatinine method. The Jaffe method involves the reaction of creatinine and picric acids in alkaline conditions. The absorbance of the formed complex is subsequently measured at 520 nanometers. Bilirubin inhibits the reaction between creatinine and alkaline picrate. Bilirubin under alkaline conditions is oxidized to biliveridin, thereby causing a decrease in absorbance. One way to deal with an icteric specimen is to first determine if the I index is above the icterus cutoff limit for the analyte of interest. If the I index isn't, you may proceed with testing. However, if the I index is above the cutoff limit, determine whether you are able to dilute the sample by referring to the manufacturer guidelines. If dilution is acceptable, you may proceed to testing after diluting the specimen. If dilution is not acceptable, you will have to explore alternative methods. An example is to use the enzymatic method rather than the Jaffe method for creatinine measurement. The lipemic index is assessed by turbidity due to elevated lipoproteins. Lipoproteins that are the primary cause of turbidity are triglyceride-rich lipoproteins such as VLDL and chylomigrons. Turbidity can be also caused by erythrocyte debris, platelets, leukocytes, fibrin clots, or contaminating particulate matter. The degree of scattering depends on the number, size, and refractive index of the suspended particles. Patient samples contain a mixture of various particle sizes. The sample appears lipemic because light is scattered at all angles. Lipemia can also interfere by causing water displacement in plasma. Normal human plasma consists of approximately 93% of water and 7% of proteins and lipids. Most laboratories utilize indirect ISC to quantitate electrolytes. In this method, the plasma is first diluted with an aqueous diluent before the electrode measurement is taken. This method makes the assumption that the sample is composed of 93% water. 
In a lipeme example, as the lipid percentage increases, the proportion of water in the sample decreases. Dilution of the sample in the aqueous diluent before indirect ISE measurement results in an overdilution effect because of less water. Ultimately, concentration of electrolytes will be falsely decreased. This phenomenon is commonly known as the electrolyte exclusion effect. The example on the slide is for a hypothetical lipemic specimen where the sodium concentration would be falsely reported as 126 millimoles per liter from an indirect ISC method. There are multiple ways to handle lipid interference. One approach is to first determine the cause of lipemia. If the cause is due to an endogenous reason, such as hypercholesterolemia, there are multiple ways to remove the lipids. You can either dilute the sample if acceptable by the manufacturer guidelines. Alternatively, you can ultracentrifuge the specimen and remove the top lipid layer and subsequently measure the analyte of interest in the infranatant. Steroids and some drugs such as valproic acid are found in the lipid layer. In such cases, removing the lipid fraction is unacceptable. These samples should be diluted to attenuate the interference while still measuring the analytes in the analytical linear range of the method. Lipid clearing agents can also be added and subsequently centrifuged. Upon centrifugation, these particles precipitate to the bottom of the tube and the analyte is measured in the supernatant. As mentioned earlier, for analytes measured by indirect ISCs, you can utilize direct ISCs. If the cause of lipemia is due to exogenous reasons, such as TPN administration, it is recommended to ask the clinical staff to redraw the specimen following appropriate guidelines to reduce contamination. In conclusion, automated assessment of hemolysis, icterus, and lipemia provides the laboratory a standardized, reproducible, and efficient tool to detect possible interference related to sample integrity. Thank you for joining me on this Pearl Laboratory Medicine on Utility of HIL in Clinical Chemistry. For more like this, as well as articles, podcasts, and more, please visit the Trainee Council at traineecouncil.org.